Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us uh, today for this uh, fantastic webinar. It's been a very uh, interesting last couple of days, but today we're going to focus on AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. Now, most financial advisors will never uh, experience uh, an interaction with AFCA. There aren't that many complaints that end up with AFCA. But where it does happen, should it happen, it is really important that you understand how the process works. But probably today, more importantly, we're going to talk also about how to avoid ending up with a complaint in AFCA. So today we're going to hear from Shale Singh, who's one of the uh, ombudsmen there at AFCA, and he will take us through some insights from AFCA, the steps uh, through the AFCA process. He's also going to give us some detail on the current statistics with complaints through to the end of September this year. We're also going to have the opportunity to look at some case studies. And I think that's fantastic because it brings this stuff into, into real life. Now, what I might do is quickly read um, Shale's bio. Uh, he's, uh, as I said, Australian Financial Complaints Authority Ombudsman. Shale was appointed by AFCA as an ombudsman when it commenced operations in 2018. Prior to being appointed as an ombudsman at AFCA, Shale worked at one of AFCA's predecessor schemes, FOS, for eight years dealing with complex investment and advice disputes. Shale has also worked as a financial planner, which is fantastic, and before that as a lawyer and legal counsel for various organisations, including the Medical Practitioners Board and WorkSafe Victoria. Shale holds a Bachelor of Science Law and also a Master's in Law from Melbourne University. He also holds an Advanced Diploma of Financial Services from Kaplan. Now, before we get, begin, I'd just like to cover off a couple of housekeeping uh, points. So if we could flick forward. Today is gonna to be one hour of CPD and you will get CPD certificates uh, for those who stay through the course of it by the end of next week. Now, uh, Whilst uh, you're online, all the webinar attendees will be on mute, but you will have the opportunity to put questions in and Shale has reserved some time at the end of the presentation to go through those questions. We ask that you put the question through the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen rather than the chat. Please don't use the chat. So I'm really pleased to ask Shale to present today on AFCA and the AFCA complaints process. Over to you. Thanks very much, Shale. Thanks, Phil. And um, great to be here today. Uh, we always enjoy these sort of interactions and dealing with, with you advisors directly, um, talking about various things, uh, showing you know that we're not here to scare anybody. Um, we have a function which is to obviously resolve disputes. Um, we're not the regulator, but essentially what we're going to do today is, is just, I'm going to talk just briefly about AFCA generally, um, how we go about things, our process, um, the, the principles we try, try to employ when we uh, make decisions. Uh, I'm going to show you our decision makers just so you can see who we all are and talk a little bit about our backgrounds. Um, go through some of the statistics just so you can get a feel for what's, uh, what we've been seeing over the last year. I've got a couple of case studies as well. Um, one on retail wholesale investors, um, which is, is always topical. Um, and a second one on the, on the code of ethics. And I've, I've uh, been pretty courageous here to tackle standard three. So we've got a case study on standard three. Um, so I'll be interested in people's views. As I said, you know, done lots of um, webinars and Zoom things over the last year. Definitely prefer the in-person version and uh, getting a bit of interaction. So um, feel free to make any any comments and um, and Phil will convey those um, uh, at the end. Um, and then look, I'll go through some of the top ten tips. They're not they're not rocket science, but they are just some of the things I think. Um, you know, that we see, and then if you do these things, you probably won't end up with us. As, as um, my boss says, uh, uh, David Locke, uh, we, we're one of the few businesses that's trying to go out of business in the sense that if there were no complaints, that would actually be, be a good thing. So just look, 
generally speaking, um, who are we? The Australian Financial Complaints Authority, I just make the point, um, and I like to stress this, we, we, are, we are not the regulator. So we're not the regulator. So, um, you know, when I talk about the code of ethics and I talk about um, things, I'm talking about it in, in how we look at those things for dispute resolution purposes. Um, we obviously pay a lot of attention to what ASIC says, uh, what FASEA previously said, what the new, you know, the new uh, panel will, will, will say in future. Um, but as part of our function, we need to uh, be having regard to those matters. So, so we're not the regulator. We're there to resolve complaints. We're a dispute resolution body. Um, we also identify systemic issues and work with financial firms to resolve them. Um, we support the regulators um, and, and ASIC, and we, we do meet with ASIC to, to advise on trends um, in things. And we do things like this, which is provide awareness of AFCA. Um, and we like to be transparent um, and discuss our approach, um, ideally before um, before you, you you come to us, not 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 that all of you will, only a very small portion do. Um, but we like to have these discussions, and and I, I actually really like getting feedback from industry um, about what they think about various approaches. Um, you know, because there is this sort of criticism that that Africa is against us, and um, you know they're, they've got it in for us. Um, you know, that's not, that's obviously not the case. I mean, I, I left the law to become a planner because um, I, I was motivated to do it. I think it's a great profession. I think, um, you know, we need, uh, more people need advice. Um, and, and in fact, I know contrary to what people think, I, I actually think that what our job does helps, helps overall, helps the industry overall. Um, so what's our role in complaint resolution? It's in everyone's interest to have matters resolved quickly. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, we see the stress um, on people, both planners and um, complainants, when, when matters come to us. So we try to resolve them as quickly as we can. We can't always do that, as, as many of you know, know. Um, but that's the aim. We, we try to get people talking. We try to have a three-way discussion. Um, often matters come to us because there's been a relationship breakdown um, and when people first come to us, they trust us. So we can generally um, build trust with your, your customers. It, it's, your, it's your relationship. And the ideal position is that we can sort out what, what's happened. And, and the ideal position is you can continue on with that relationship. And that, that can happen, um, provided certain things are ticked off. And, and one of the big ones is that uh, a lot of the time people feel that they just want to explain what they feel the harm is um, because of bad advice. Um, and sometimes just hearing it is enough to, to, to move on. We identify and focus on the real issues. Lots of people get confused about what the issues are. Um, obviously, we can't look at investment performance. Um, we need to find that there's been some sort of flaw in the, in the overall advice process. We provide an independent view based on fairness and we're flexible and adaptable to meet parties' needs. What that means is that, um, you know, we deal with a, a huge variety of the, of the population, um, uh, you know, in terms of language, in terms of mental health, in terms of financial literacy, and we try to adapt. I mean, some people just don't read documents very well. Um, so we try to adapt our process to that, and we try to adapt to the nature of the dispute. Um, we deal with some disputes up to half a million dollars, uh, right through to a fee dispute over a couple of hundred. And we, we try to uh, have a, have a uh, bespoke, I think is the word you use, process for each, each dispute. Um, just really quickly, the resolution process, it comes in. I mean, you know, you go through IDR, then there's registration with us. Um, we do send it back to try to get, uh, get it resolved that way. Uh, and the fee is very minimal at that point. We go through workflow. Which means we, you know, we try to assess what's about. It's about banking. It's about credit cards. It's about um, financial planning. It's about stockbroking. We review the jurisdiction, so we do um, uh, consider whether it's within our rules to look at. And for for those of you who are more um, legally sort of based, uh, you would have seen there was a recent decision, uh, DH Flinders, in the Supreme Court of New South Wales recently. Um, which talked a little bit about, about our jurisdiction. 
um, which we're currently considering and trying to work out, um, you know, what response uh, we take to that. Case management. So we assign the matter to a case manager um, and they try to negotiate it first, then do a more formal conciliation. If that doesn't work, a preliminary assessment, which is normally written, but we can do verbal ones, giving a view. And then we go to a final decision um, uh, right at the end of the process. General approach, our rules say that we must do what is fair in all the circumstances having regard to le legal principles, applicable industry codes or guidance, good industry practice and previous relevant determinations of AFCA or predecessor schemes. But ultimately we must do what's fair in the circumstances. Um, a lot of people say, oh, well, does all this mean that um, AFCA can just um, ignore the law because we must have regard to the law? Um, well, that's not, that's not correct because if we do depart from what the law says, we're allowed to do it, we have to explain why that leads to manifest unfairness. So... What you can expect from us, if, if it does come to us, um, we'll do an independent review of issues and merits of the complaint. Um, we don't have an interest in it. I know we shouldn't have to need to say that, but we, we don't have an interest in which way it goes. We just want it resolved. Um, we have experienced complaint resolution staff with industry knowledge. Uh, we will engage respectfully with you and, 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 and make the point that um, particularly single uh, licensee advisors, um, very stressful to go through this process. Um, and we're very conscious of that. So we, we try to um, uh, deal with a dispute knowing, knowing the stress on you as well as the consumer. Um, regular telephone contact is the objective. Um, you know, we do get inundated from time to time, so it can be hard, but that's the aim. We target requests for information. We, we, we try to be efficient in terms of what we ask for. And we have a flexible and adaptable complaint resolution model. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about what that, what that meant. Um, what we expect from our members, what we'd like you to do with us is if it does, firstly, obviously, uh, come along to things like this is great because we can tell you how to avoid coming to us, firstly. Um, if you are with us, um, active engagement is really, really important. We want your views on things. We want your views on what the issue is. Why did this happen? Um, what the loss is. I mean, loss is such an important one um, because people, for example, enter investments and think they've lost money, but that's just the pension payments that have been coming out, for example. Um, so if you do a proper analysis of a loss, sometimes there, is, there, there may not be any loss at all. And, and advisors are very well placed to, to, to give us that information. Uh, we, we want you to work with us to resolve complaints. We're not, you know, we're not an adversarial process. Um, we, we, uh, we're all turning to dispute resolution. So, um, you know, there has been a trend of getting PI insurers involved and uh, legal counsel involved. I, I personally don't, don't know if it adds a lot. Um, I tend to prefer to talk to parties directly particularly the advisor, if possible. Um, but, um, you know, we, we're all tuned into dispute resolution. Um, open and honest with us. If you, you know, everyone makes mistakes. If you've made a mistake and you feel it's a mistake, tell us. Um, and, in fact, that can, that can often, you know, you know, we can deal with that. Um, negotiate in good faith. Um, provide all information in a timely manner. Um, the principles underpinning the process, so fairness is the key one. Um, we are required to, to satisfy the rules of natural justice, which all that really means is that you understand the case against you and you have the chance to respond. You have an adequate chance to respond. Um, I've mentioned accessibility. Uh, we try to engender trust. Um, simplicity is the aim. The aim is not to complicate things with lots of case law, uh, but to try to have a common sense view on things. Um, uh, timeliness, we try to do things quickly, efficiently, transparent, which is part of why we're here today, um, to, to, you know, transparently discuss with you some of our approaches and things, um, and effective engagement. These are the um, good-looking crew of decision-makers, um, and you might have dealt with some of them, so uh, 
Next to me is Jackie Peroni, uh, Ian Donald, um, Nick Crowhurst. Uh, we've got Vicky down the left. She's actually an adjudicator, which is in our fast track area. So they're deal, dealing with lower, lower um, value disputes. That's Vicky Carter, um, Alex Sadati, and Nat Cameron, who you might have seen at the conference. Nat is our current lead. Um, variety of experience. Um, you know, I won't go into everyone's individual experience because we are we are a team. Um, obviously, Phil mentioned I've, I've worked in the um, as an advisor 2008 to about 2010 um, in a in a, um, a I suppose you call it boutique um, licensee out in the suburbs of Melbourne. Um, with these these law firm experience, um, these ASIC experience. Um, some people have been have held senior roles in big financial services companies. Um, some have conciliation uh, conciliation focus, um, and, and you know some have just a, a lot of time in dispute resolution. So we are now the stats. Um, always try to um, bring this to life, otherwise it all gets a bit dry. But I mean, it's really interesting. There's 80,000 complaints received as of 30 September 2020. That's for, um, for um, uh, AFCA overall. Um, as you can see, the vast majority, 41%, uh, 27,000 are against uh, banks and, uh, and are about um, you know, maladministration of loans, uh, about credit cards, um, uh, those sort of matters. Um, you know, you get 10, 10,000 odd credit providers, um, uh, payday loans and, and the like, about 5,000 are against superannuation fund trustees or advisors. Um, and you see our area is, 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 that, um, is the investments area, about 6%, so about 4,000. So not a huge amount overall, and, and, and that is the reality. Um, as I've said before, that the, the, the perception is there's lots of complaints about advisors. In fact, there aren't. I'm going to break this down a bit more for you just to show you um, what this looks like. Complaints received, so out of the, you know, the 5,000, this is how it breaks down monthly. We have, you know, you go from 200 right through to 500 every month, depending on the month. Um, it, it's hard to work out why. Obviously, with the initiation of AFCA back two years ago, um, there was a lot of public, publicity about it. The Banking Royal Commission meant there were lots of complaints. Um, and you occasionally see spikes based on if there is publicity, you know, if, if, if um, the ABC runs a story or, you know, a current affair runs a story about advice. Um, obviously, one of the big ones in the, in the press, certainly in the WA press at the moment, is the Sterling First Group. Um, which is one that we're, um, we're looking at and we've issued a decision on, on that, which is available on our website if you're interested. Um, accepted complaints. So of that number, we don't accept all of those. It's 3,343 uh, we accept. Uh, we do like to show this stat of something probably that we, we're not too happy with. We do like to get responses um, and you'll see that there are 50 in, in, in September, we had 54 non responses out of 260 complaints, which isn't ideal. That means things are delayed. We haven't heard from the firm. We don't know their position. So I think tip one um, should be uh, if you do have a complaint, we really, really encourage a response as quickly as possible. Um, it actually helps everything um, uh, move along. Um, now, in terms of the investments and advice complaints, so those that 6% I talked about, about 4,500, the top five product shares actually is the, is the highest at, at 670. Um, foreign exchange is within this group as well. So FX trading, um, 633. Um, super funds, 420, mixed asset, 388, property, 379. Uh, Top five industry types in this area. I mean, it's no surprise that of industry types in this area, 962 um, are planners, but um, derivatives dealers obviously is a, is, is a high number. Stockbrokers are 488. Um, complaints received in the top five. So of that, um, that uh, investments, um, th those complaints, 781 and misleading products and service information. So just, you know, disclosure of, of various um, uh, characteristics of a particular product 
um, you know, disclosure of fees, of fees. What is the ongoing service arrangement going to look like? Um, and I noticed today they're going to, there's only one um, statement for fees, which is which is uh, welcome news, I think, that being able to explain the fees you charge and the fees going forward in one document, which which is great. Um, inappropriate advice is 556 and failure to act in best interest is 508. Obviously, that so that inappropriate advice and best interest is the same thing. But as some of you may be aware, the government allowed us to accept legacy disputes uh, over the last year. So that related to disputes going back to 2008. So occasionally we had to apply the um, appropriateness test for advice received prior to 1 July 13. Service quality is a big one, failure to follow instructions. Um, where do they close? A quarter close very early and only 10% go to decision. I think that's the main point I'd like to make there because I do want to get into of those investment disputes, if we now get into actual financial advice complaints, 1,200. So, you know, um, of 80,000, it, it is not many, less than 2%, in fact. Um, and, of course, the big ones are the, the failure to act in the client's best interests. Um, fees also is another, uh, another one that um, is, continues to be a problem, just explaining what the fees are, what service arrangement was agreed to and misleading, you know, uh, product or service information. Um, SMSFs are, are 170 odd, um, super funds 260. Income protection insurance continues to be a big one advice, you know, on greed, indemnity value, policies, those sort of things are not covered, you know, small business owners not covered in the way they thought they would be. Um, now, I'd like to just go through the, the outcomes because people are always curious about which way we lean in terms of complainant or financial firm. Of the 1,200, 25% a quarter are resolved by the firm directly, which is great. That's the main aim. That is the main aim that we're, that we're trying, to, um, trying to achieve. 10% um, are discontinued. Um, so... Um, that's not ideal because it means that um, complainants might have given up um, and they may have a valid um, type of case. Um, decision in favour of complainant, 8% and 5% financial firm. That, that is slightly higher towards the complainant, probably not as high as some people expect, but it does oscillate. Um, it can be the other way around. Broadly, COVID-19, just, just a couple of things to mention on that. I mean, obviously, we, we um, you know, Victoria's going uh, terrifically, um, you know, 38, 39 days. Um, vaccine uh, talk, although I did, uh, I did see that um, there were some complications around the vaccine. But anyway, covid um, we work we work closely with the other bodies um, regarding to the challenges of COVID. We 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 modified approaches um, and outcomes. We extended timeframes. We provided um, fact sheets and information about it. Broadly speaking, mo most of the complaints, not surprisingly, were in banking, and and you know um, they were financial difficulty type complaints. Um, uh, insurance, of course, was another one. Uh, particularly travel, travel insurance was a big one. Investments and advice was very low. It was 114. Um, we didn't really find any theme at the moment, but look, we do anticipate that there might be a bit of a delayed effect. Um, people may be complaining about, um, you know, withdrawing super. They might realise later on that it wasn't a good idea um, and then target the advisor. Um, and, and, you know, we might get those complaints down the track. We did get, with market volatility, we always get, um, you know, margin calls, FX, CFD type disputes. <clears throat> of course, the market recovered fairly well, so that often does, um, you know, um, sort of cut, cut, um, mean people are less likely to complain. Let me put it that way. Now, we're going to, um, I did notice there was a hand up, which is great, but we'll deal with those at the end. Phil will um, talk about those at the end. We will um, just go through some case studies. So we're on time. 
I've got two for you. I always just like to just do the overview before we, we go into it. So prior to 1 July 13, simple terms, know your, product, know your client, provide appropriate advice. 1 July 13 to 1 January 20, we had an obligation to act in the best interest. So you need to satisfy all those three things and then um, act in the best interest of the client. Now, 1 January 20 onwards, um, the additional obligation is the code of ethics obligations. Um, and um, that, that, that changes things. To anticipate a question, we do look at the time at which the conduct occurred and apply the regulatory guidance as of that time. So we're not going to be applying, we're not, we're not going to be applying the code of ethics for conduct prior to 1 January 2020. Now, the first situation we've got is a retail um, wholesale example. Um, John says the financial firm, this is a real case, and I'm happy to send it out um, at the end. John says the financial firm gave him misleading information about initial public offerings. He was seeking compensation of 1.7 mil. He had a qualified account certificate which said that he held assets of 2.5 million, um, but not the SNSF that he was in. Um, or as trustee of the SMSF, it was actually in his individual name. Um, the certificate said, we understand that for the purposes of being classified as a sophisticated investor, the legal entities in, in, uh, listed in the account certificate will be eligible to invest in, in boutique offerings that arise from time to time, et cetera, et cetera. Sophisticated investors are exempt from normal disclosure requirements necessary to the provision of financial services. Um, these include the, you know, all the documents you'd be aware of, the disclosure documents, the FSG, the SOA, the product disclosure statements. Now, the complainant, the reason he complained was he said that the circumstances in which he signed the SIA, the, the sophisticated investor acknowledgement, were that he was told that it gives him access to all the good and profitable deals, not available to the ordinary investor. This is where the real money is made. Um, don't bother with the details of the form. Just sign it and get it back to the advisor so we can make some real money. This is just a standard form that everyone uses. Now, when, you know, ASIC has some guidance on this, uh, media release 14191, which talks about where the financial service relates to a super product, the trustee of the SMSF will be classified as retail unless the fund holds net assets of at least $10 million. Um, if it does not relate to a super product, the general test for determining whether the trustee is retail or wholesale um, applies under the Corporations Act. So there's different views on this, but, you know, if on one view, if you're providing advice to an SMSF, then it relates to a super product on one view. And according to that, you're classified as retail um, if, if the fund holds net assets of at least 10 million. What, what ASIC then goes on to say is that um, where the trustee of an existing super fund receives advice, ASIC will not take action if the person providing the advice determines whether the trustee is a wholesale client based on the general test, i.e. if they have $2.5 million. So it's sort of saying that if, if it relates to a super product, which most SMS are, um, they'll consider that those people are retail for less than 10 mil, but it won't take action where you've got a, a certificate in the same way um, as you would for normal you know, wholesale um, client. And then it says, although ASIC will not take action with such services are provided um, with less than 10 million, this will not affect any private right of action that may be available to third parties. Now, I, I just show you that and, and show you that that's, that's what the, the, the media release that you're probably aware of. In the end, um, you know, we certainly take the view that um, if, if someone uh, is, is an SMSF and the person is classified as wholesale um, as less than 10 million, have it over 2.5, we would, we would accept that um, in a lot of circumstances, obviously, because that person has been properly classified for those purposes. 
But in this particular case, that we were satisfied that the complainant didn't read the um, the acknowledgement as it informed and reasonably believed, believed the document to be a standard form everyone uses. Importantly, the advisor, there was no evidence the advisor explained the consequences of signing the form. Now, those of you who have done your um, procedure exam, and I'm not sure we, whether we call that anymore, the, you know, the advice exam, um, would know that standard one, in fact, uses a very similar example to this of saying that it's adequate whether someone has uh, $2.5 million of assets to treat them as wholesale. Um, and it puts that sort of extra step in of explaining, explaining it um, and checking that the person is in fact um, sophisticated. Um, now the advisor didn't do that here. In fact, the complainant was overseas. This was all done by email and the advisor in his statement acknowledged he didn't explain it. So we, we decided, this went before a panel, that the complainant was unaware of the consequences of signing the form and he wasn't also given adequate time to consider it before signing it. If the advisor had demonstrated that with a file note that he explained it, um, and he w went through and explained the consequences of it, I think this dispute would have gone um, a different way. Now, of course, the other thing with this one is that the complainant cherry-picked his losing trade. So um, he, he, he only complained about the losing trades, but, of course, they made, you know, some of these trades made money as well. So um, he calculated the SMSF loss as 1.702 million. Now, um, that's obviously over a, over a cap, over a million dollars. Um, but, um, uh, sorry, it was 500,000 at this time because this was actually an old uh, pre predecessor dispute. Um, but, of course, you can't cherry pick your loss. You, you, you've got to look at the portfolio in its entirety for determining loss. Um, so what we said was that the loss is the actual portfolio performance overall against a suitable portfolio which was in the ASX 200. Uh, in the end, he ended up with about 180,000 with a contribution of 25% because he, we felt he was partially responsible for that loss and ended up with about 130 odd thousand. Um, we, which in all honesty, actually wasn't, wasn't happy, wasn't that happy with, but you know, we're often in a situation where no, not everyone's gonna be happy. And in fact, if, if both parties are slightly unhappy, you've normally probably done a good job. Now, I'm going to do the second, the second case study is on the code of ethics, um, the much talked about code of ethics. Um, and I just want to make this point, you know, we, we did the, we had our AFCA forums and, and I did get lots of questions on, on um, you know, who are AFCA to be uh, telling us about the code of ethics um, and those sort of things. I understand that and, and you know, we, we're not the regulator. What we are is the dispute resolution body. But hopefully this will help you sort of understand why we need to look at it. Because the rules say that we need to do what's fair having regard to legal principles, industry codes, good industry practice and previous relevant decisions. Now, as you will know, the code did come into play from 1 January 2020. And as you would also probably know, is it's a legislative instrument. So it's, it's law, technically speaking. Um, so we have to have regard to it for conduct from 1 January 2020. Um, just, you know, the legislative basis 921A of the Courts Act is the one that um, requires all relevant providers, which are advisors, not their licensee, um, to comply with the Code of Ethics. And it's mandatory from 1 January 2020. I said that formed part of the law. Now, it's obviously principles based rather than a checklist which, um, you know, I know there's been lots of criticism about that because people sort of want to know, tick cross, particularly compliance people, what should we, what should we do, you know? But, of course, it's principle-based, which is, which is uh, challenging. Um, and, you know, the legislative instrument states, collectively financial planners and advisors are members of Australia's newest profession. As such, while they formally provide a commercial service, they should be committed to offering a professional service. That's what it's all about. And I think at its best, once things settle down and there's ambiguity, um, particularly around standard three and standard six about the long-term effects of things to settle down, I think, I mean, I ultimately think it will be a benefit. And I think hopefully it will bring, bring um, more people to see advisors. 
um, eventually. And, and um, you know, that's that's hopefully where we, where we'll all be at um, as a profession in a year or two. Um, it's a values-based code, and no one would disagree with the values. You've got to be trustworthy. You've got to be competent. You've got to be honest. You've got to be fair, and you've got to be diligent. Obviously, the problem is how that's implemented with various standards. Comply with the law, the intent of the law, you know that, act with integrity, avoid conflicts. Um, you know, uh, in the latest guidance, obviously just October, I think it was, um, they, you know, to see tries to make this point that they are concerned about actual conflicts, not perceived conflicts, um, and that they seek not to ban any particular form of remuneration. Um, and if you can demonstrate things are in the best interest, uh, then you're not in breach of that standard three. Client must give informed consent, which I think is a matter of common sense, is, is important that they understand what the advice is. Um, standard six, obviously, is another one taken into account. The broad effects of the advice um, is always one that um, people find challenging. I've seen, I mean, I think it was the FPA that, that said that that meant that and that you need to take into account uh, you know, social, ethical investments. That's what it meant. Um, I think there's different views on that. I'm not sure that was what the intent uh, of that was. Um, and the example I often sort of give with that one is sort of a, a, a if you tell someone who's close to retirement to enter an SMSF and buy property, then you, and you know they are going to retire in five years. You need to consider how they're going to... Uh, turn that into an income stream when they do retire. You know, and I think that's more what it's what it's getting at, which which most of you know most of you would 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 no doubt do second nature. Um, fees represent value for money. Um, you know, people often people sort of often will think about whether they pay four dollars or eight dollars for you know to be outraged pay eight dollars for a cup of coffee. But when they're paying $10,000 on a million dollar portfolio, they don't give it as much thought um, as to what they're getting for that money. And I think that's what this standard is getting at. Acting good faith. Um, I like upholding ethical standards of the profession. Um, we run panels. We have financial planning members on those panels. And it's often the financial planners that are most aggrieved by other planners' conduct. So I think it's really important that, that you all hold each other to account. Uh, what's our approach to the code? Well, we, we have to have regard to it. Um, our deputy went out saying that we will take a measured and considered approach to interpreting the code by giving it its practical meaning, taking into account the intentions and objectives of the code, the current environment that the code operates in, um, for CS guidance, and you know, obviously is we need to look at point in time sort of stuff as well. What the guidance was at relevant times, ASIC's expectations. Actually, I haven't revised this slide, but you know, there is now a code monitoring body, which is ASIC really, or via this panel. Um, but that will hopefully provide a bit, bit more guidance as to how things are done. Um, we've only had one dispute where the code's been raised. Um, and that, that's settled. So we haven't made a decision on the code, but we will certainly, uh, I, I, you know, very conscious of all the uncertainties around it. I think it'd be extremely unlikely we'd make a decision based solely on the code um, with the uncertainties, particularly around the more, uh, you know, controversial standards, three and seven, um, you know, but, as time goes on and as things settle with the code, I imagine it will become more, more important. So um, the second case study is just one around standard three. I'm interested, I mean, I, I would think most people here would be in agreement about this, but um, coupled with two young children seeks advice. Um, one's working limited hours while raising the children, but has full-time earning potential about 115K. The other is 115K plus overtime. They've got a combined 131K in super and in the process of selling an investment property worth a uh, million dollars. Their key objectives are in the short term to purchase a family home. But, you know, they're young, they have an investment property, they want to buy a house um, with 1.6 mil. They want to build super in the medium uh, term and longer term, maybe interested in purchasing uh, an additional property. 
Now, the advisor says that, and this is based on real facts, that after the sale, of, but it was before the code of ethics, after the sale of the investment property, the couple should direct 50,000 of the proceeds to their super as a non-concessional. Direct the remaining proceeds to the new, new home purchase, establish an SMSF, roll over all their super in the SMSF, borrow within the SMSF to purchase an investment property up to 450,000, borrowing 70% you know, of the purchase price, um, retain the remaining SMSF funds in an offset account for future investment opportunities. Um, I'd be really, I'd be fascinated to see what people's views are on this. Uh, I have run this scenario before with a number of, of other advisors um, and the reactions are interesting. Um, that's, that's what the advice was. Um, now, just to make this even more complicated, the financial firm is part of a group of companies that includes a real estate agency. The advice, the, the advisor emphasises the importance of property selection to the strategy and refers the couple to that real, realty arm. The realty arm works with the advisor and the couple to provide a property recommendation to align with the SLA. The real estate agent received a 6.6 .6 commission on the property sale. Real case, real case, by the way. Um, but I've adapted it because this is a two to because it was pre uh, uh, the code. Um, so is this a conflict of interest? Um, well, <laughs> I think there's a real chance of a conflict of interest here. Um, in the most recent, I'm just trying to see if I can get it. The most recent guidance, um, they say that. Um, the standard for judging a conflict is if a disinterested person, this is page 18, who knows all the facts, would reasonably conclude that the arrangement could induce the advisor to act other than in the best interest of the client. That arrangement gives rise to a conflict and is prohibited. I think applying that test, this may well. Um, does disclosure fix a problem? Well, not anymore, not since the Code of Ethics. You're not allowed to have a conflict. Is the advisor allowed to recommend property from which are related into the profits? It's an interesting question. I, my reading is I think it is possible in limited circumstances if you can show that it's in someone's best interests. But here, I don't really understand what it would be because the couple wanted to purchase a house. They had an investment property with equity in it. You know, I'm sorry if this sounds overly simple, but I just wonder if the best thing to do would have been to use those proceeds to buy the house rather than using some to buy the house, put 50,000 in, you'd start an SMSF. I'm not sure why uh, an SMSF was required for those, for that younger couple who probably won't have a lot of time on their hands assuming they have a couple of kids, um, you know, and then borrow an SMSF, which then exposes them to a lot of risk. So. I'm not sure it could be demonstrated here that that was in their best interests. Um, that's that's that one. I uh, just to finish with, we, we'll go through some of the uh, the top ten tips. And as I said, it's not not rocket science. Sorry, this is this slides out of place. But standard two, standard three, standard five, uh, six, seven, and nine are all relevant to that example. Now, um, top ten tips for advisors. File notes, take detailed file notes, contemporaneous file notes are always uh, the answer. In that first example, as I said, I think if there was a contemporaneous file note explaining the process for that wholesale certificate um, and how it was given to the um, complainant, that would have changed things. Um, there wasn't one. Um, so take contemporaneous file notes. They don't have to be perfect. Uh, a contemporaneous bad file note is better than no file note at all. Um, and I do remember what it was like where you're going from one thing to another, filling out an insurance application, that's what I did, and then talk to someone about their, you know, the GFC, then go to something else, go to a client meeting. Um, so it's hard, I, I understand that. But, um, you know, some sort of contemporaneous file note is really, really helpful. And clear goals and strategy, put it into the client's words, I think. Um, you know, not just a general wealth creation or capital security. Uh, how will, you know, what were they actually after? Give us the, the, the detail of the person. Um, 
what what you know there are teachers are you know they're looking to um, expand their horizons by traveling um, but when they come back you know so we'd like to hear hear I think that that bring those things to life is really important turn clients away if you don't have the expertise I mean the the, the code of ethics requires that you uh, have adequate competence to advise. Um, explain the risks, particularly for clients who want to act against your advice. Um, now, there's different views on whether you should continue to act or not. Uh, I don't have all the answers, so I don't not, you know, I'd be interested in your views on that. Um, so explain the type of service you're providing. Obviously, this is really important for scaled advice, for limited advice, which obviously ASIC is doing a bit of a, a study on at the moment because they realise how important it is. And I think, um, you know, compliance departments have gone mad a little bit in terms of the level of inquiries they make, need to make you make sometimes for scaled advice. You know, I've heard of some ridiculous stories about where it's just, just purely on, on insurance premiums uh, and you're required to do a holistic fact find. I mean, it doesn't really make sense and that doesn't really benefit the client. Uh, is it execution only? Use your templates carefully, use your risk profile carefully, you'd all, all know that. Um, super switching in SMSF, you need know, a good reason to switch. I think it needs to be a good reason for an SMSF. We don't have a fixed balance in mind. Uh, you know, I accept the fact that uh, smaller balances in an SMSF of, 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 of whatever amount might be suitable depending on the particular person, but are they willing to satisfy the trustee duties? Do they have the time? Do they have the interest? You know, that, that's the sort of things we, we look at. Understand the products yourself. I know it sounds so simple, but that's one of the best value adds I think an advisor can give. Use your expertise to explain products to people in simple terms. The products are not getting simpler. They're getting more and more complicated. Um, and, you know, people need uh, you, you, you guys to really come in and, uh, and explain to them what they're getting into. Uh, be clear about the advice relationship. So that is the, the formal presentation. Um, but we might just uh, bring Phil back and see if we want to do some questions. Thanks, Shale. And um, it, it's great to uh, listen to your presentation, which I think has been fantastic to give context to the way AFCA operates. Uh, we've had a bunch of questions and I might start with, uh, with some of them with respect to the examples. Uh, I like uh, one comment, uh, if you are selling hammers, every problem looks like a nail, case study two. Um, but probably, I mean, I think that's more a statement than a question. The, uh, the, one of the questions was, what did you rule read the SMSF property case? Yeah, so we, we found, as I said, that was before the uh, Code of Ethics um, came in. But we, we found that the advisor was not acting in the best interest of that particular client because we didn't understand how uh, uh, borrowing in their circumstances or uh, starting an SMSF was in their interest. So we, we actually found for the complainant there, but are purely on best interest on 961. Right. Um, now, the next question uh, is, is from someone who's obviously had experience with AFCA and look, some of these questions um, might be a little bit uh, challenging, but how does AFCA verify the facts? I've had contemporaneous file notes discounted by AFCA because the client denied it. Yeah, look, that, uh, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, we, 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 we're a written-based system, right? So we can't, we don't cross-examine people. Um, in circumstances where he said, she said, we look to the contemporaneous material. Um, I, I, I did say here that file notes are often very critical. I, I can't comment on the exact circumstances of that. I'm not sure why, um, but essentially my answer to that is we're written-based he said, she said, it can be very, very tricky. Sometimes we can't decide, but we need to try and we look to the surrounding documentation, the file notes, 
um, the SLA, the, um, the circumstances overall um, to, to try to work that out. If it gets very hard, we send it to a panel. Great, okay. An another question here, which I think is probably a quick one is, read the SMSF case study. Do you have jurisdiction to ask for other client files that are similar, find patterns? I, I suspect the answer is no, but uh, Shale, maybe if you can have a look at that. Uh, look, find patterns. It's, it's actually a really good question as well, because we, you know, in that case, if we found a number of similar type of matters, I mean, I think it would uh, probably help the complainant in, in that case. Um, do we have jurisdiction? Well, we can ask for what we want. Um, do people have to provide it? Well, they, they, they do, but if it relates to another matter, um, then it's not really related to that dispute before us. So um, we would need sort of, I mean, if, if a financial firm wanted to show us what they're doing in other matters, we'd certainly consider it. Um, but we wouldn't sort of have jurisdiction in that sense. Uh, now, a question on case study number one. Just curious how the client wasn't provided adequate time to consider the SIA when it was emailed to him, presumably signed and returned at his convenience. Yeah, it was, well, it was, there was pressure from the advisor to have it signed and return quickly to uh, not miss out on, on one of these deals. Um, now, I can't remember the exact time frame whether it was same day or not. Um, and, and I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear in the example, but it, it, was, a, it was sort of a pressure uh, uh, sale technique where it was, you need to get this back to me as soon as you can uh, to, to, so that I can get you into this. Fine. Uh, now, another question that I, is relay, relating to PI insurance, but it might be worthwhile because I'm not sure that you have any visibility of that. Regarding case study one, as the advisor didn't disclose certain vital points, and this was stated in the SOA, therefore, did the advisor's PI pay out the claim or was the advisor liable for the total amount? Good question. I think, another good question, I think that um, in that case, look, they were, the, the complaint was paid. I believe the PI did stump up there. But the point is well made. Uh, PIs do, uh, there, there are cases, in fact, I've got one in front of me right now, where the PI is refusing coverage on certain things. Um, now, essentially, we're not the regulator of PI. Uh, and as you know, it's sort of ASIC is determined it's, it's privatised. What we're worried about is the licensee and that they're able to pay. So um, I do take the point that, that sometimes PI won't come to the party, but the way the system works at the moment is if we make a decision, that licensee is, is responsible for it, for paying it. Yeah, agreed. Um, a question from Saul, does the client need to have suffered a financial loss? I think you've already answered this one, but uh, leave it with you. Yeah, well, that, that's right. I mean, we, we, I mean, they do. I mean, we could look, we could, if there's a service complaint and there's no loss, such as um, they delayed and it caused me stress, we, we, we may look at that. But, but as a rule, uh, there would need to be loss, yes, because or, as I said, often, well, not often, but sometimes um, there is no actual loss. And therefore, even if there's a finding against the financial firm, we can't award any, any loss. So we, we wouldn't proceed with something like that. Great, okay, uh, there's, a, there's a few questions in here that I guess are um, addressed at some of the basic premise under which AFCA operates, which uh, I think you and I know, but um, a question, uh, what are costs for clients? I think nothing, I think he's right. He is right, he is right. Um, so no, c consumers don't pay anything to go to, to AFCA, which is similar to other ombudsman systems around the world. Um, but, you know, I should just make the comment, Phil, that that's not something we have control over. I mean, that's determined by, by government, really, how that works. Yeah, which is, a, which is a good point that AFCA was established following the Ramsey inquiry. The rules were preset by the government. Um, AFCA 
it is an establishment of, of, uh, of the law, although it's important to understand because some people think AFCA is a government department. AFCA is actually um, a, a company limited by guarantee that's owned by the members and, and that's not well understood. Although, although, Phil, some of the complaints who come to us do understand that very well and say that as a result, we're biased against them. But uh, uh, yes, that's exactly, that's exactly accurate. Okay, uh, question here. How do you view scoped advice, e.g. 60 year old working and intends to continue to do so, investment advice only, retirement planning, estate planning needed, but to be addressed later? Should loss incur due to any reason? How do you view it? Oh, look, I, I, I personally view, view it that it, it's important to communicate with the client as to what they want and what you can offer and come to a, an agreed position. That, that's how I view it. I mean, you know, some people might say, well, they're coming into retirement, you need to cover off estate planning and risk and you need to do this and this. I would argue that some people don't necessarily want that. Um, the reality is it's their money. Um, it's their life. They can do what they want. The advisor needs to tell them about those services. But if someone is adamant that they only want X service and they want to pay for X, uh, I think that should be allowed, personally. Okay, there's a question here is uh, about um, financial advisors being charged um, for complaints, given the, the legal construct, um, clients don't have to pay. Uh, the only way to fund AFCA is through uh, the, the fees that are paid by um, financial firms. So I won't put that question to you. Well, I, I can just say, though, that, I mean, the, 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 our chief talks about it, it, the way I think you should view it is the cost of doing business. Okay. How do individual case managers and the panel who provide determinations work to arrive at consistent outcomes? Does AFCA review case managers who consistently arrive at decisions at odds with the rest? Yeah, look, really, really important question because we, we, we try to be consistent. It's really important. And, and, you know, if there is, I mean, it's a tricky area. So there are going to be reasonable minds might differ on certain things. But we have uh, really rigid uh, consultation processes. So there is an ombudsman available every day for case managers to, to talk to. Um, we would, would, would uh, like to think that the case manager will give you AFCA's view, not their own individual view. Um, and um, we work very hard to the training uh, and discussing approaches to, to various things to, to prevent that. That's not the situation we want, where if you go to different case managers, you might get different, different views um, with the rider that reasonable minds might differ on certain things. Okay, uh, Shale, we're just about out of time. Uh, there's one uh, request, which was for the case number for the reference that you referred to earlier on, which I think was DH Flinders case. Um, so maybe we can get that and provide that to participants afterwards. Oh, you, you want the, uh, so sorry, the first case study, I can, that's a no, case. No, sorry, it was much earlier in the presentation when you referred to a recent court case in Victoria. Oh, sorry, court case. Oh, I'm happy to send that right. That's, 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 um, that's publicly available. That's on the Supreme Court of New South Wales website. So I'm happy to let people know about that, sure. Fantastic. A uh, question from Melinda, what are the qualifications and experience of the case managers? Um, there's, look, there's a variety. Um, we, we like to draw from a, from a, from a pool of lawyers, um, financial advisors, stockbrokers, um, and alternative dispute resolution specialists and other, you know, government or whatever else. Um, so, you know, it is true that you might, you know, I, I, I'm a lawyer and advisor, but the reality is you may get, you know, a alternative dispute resolution specialist or a planner or a, uh, or a lawyer. Um, but uh, as it, my, my answer to that is that we, we try to work as a team to make sure the result is, is consistent and all case managers 
a QA as well and by a team manager. So um, variety, the answer there's a variety of, 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 of skills, um, but, but I take the point that, that some are, you know, have more knowledge of the industry than others. Um, but my answer to that is we try to work as a team to try to, uh, you know, make sure that, that the approach is consistent. And I guess the question is coming from the fact that you've got planning experience and you've got an ADFS. Um, I guess they're asking whether that's uh, whether whether uh, some sort of qualifications in advice is mandatory for someone working on advice complaints. Uh, the answer is no, actually, at, at, at the moment. But we do have advisors doing it, and we do encourage people to to uh, consider the the deployments. But it's not mandatory. Okay. Now I think we've only got that question time for one last question. This is a little bit of a provocative one, but it was the the first question asked. A year or two back, AFCA had stands in shopping centres in Melbourne and uh, there were um, staff there who were asking passers-by whether they had any complaints against advisors over the last 10 years. Um, why was this? Uh, okay. Well, I mean, look, why that was, was that there was a, um, uh, there, there was a study done by ASIC which showed that uh, there wasn't a high awareness in the public uh, of AFCA. So the idea was not, not you know, not, not, not the view that we, we, we weren't trying to encourage complaints. I know, I know it's a fine line. We were trying to ensure there was awareness of AFCA. Now, I'm, I'm not entirely, look, I, wasn't, I didn't actually do those. I'm not entirely sure what the questions being asked were, but the, the idea was that ASIC, uh, a study had shown that there were three out of 100 or something new about AFCA. The idea was to, to increase awareness of AFCA and what it does. It wasn't to um, generate complaints. Fantastic. All right, uh, Shreya, if we can just move to the last slide, we might just quickly um, wrap this up. Um, so access to the webinar and the content will be available um, for those who, who haven't um, had the chance to sit in for the whole thing. They can still do it uh, as a uh, as an online um, viewing and uh, subject to completing an assessment quiz, they can get CPD as well. Um, all registrants will receive an email confirming when that's available. And if you do have any questions from today, then please get in touch with the AFA at info at afa.asn.au. Shale, I'd very much like to thank you for the presentation today. I thought it was excellent. This is an area that uh, gets to the core of of what you need to do to avoid ending up with a, a complaint, whether that complaint uh, goes through the you know, internal dispute resolution process or it ends up at AFCA. Everyone has an incentive to make sure that financial advisors are delivering quality advice and that clients have nothing to complain about. And as you said, your, your, uh, your CEO has the objective of trying to do yourself out of business and, uh, and if we can deliver our part in that, then that would be a great outcome. So Shale, thank you very much for your uh, presentation today. Thanks very much, Phil. Thanks everyone.